Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. Imagine if you went to buy a car, and rather than one price for the car, you had to essentially buy it a la carte. You had to negotiate a separate price for the wheels, for the engine, for the paint, for seats, all separate, all different suppliers, and all with hidden fees. Sounds ridiculous, right? But it's essentially how we pay for health care in America. It's no wonder, then, that there is no more polarizing issue than the delivery and cost of health care. It's why it's front and center in our politics, and it affects all of our lives. It's a system that itself makes us sick. And yet still it's amazing how many people say that they like their doctors but hate the system, a system that's broken, that has lost public trust, that's become a business model in which price gouging is built in, and outcomes are not even part of the pricing. It corrupts the very people who often set out as idealists. We're going to talk about that today with my guest, Dr. Marty McCary. Dr. McCary is a New York Times bestselling author and Johns Hopkins surgeon and professor of health policy. He was named one of America's 20 most influential people in health care and served in a leadership role with Dr. Atoll Gawande on the World Health Organization Surgery Checklist Project. He's published more than 250 scientific articles, and his book, Unaccountable, was adapted as the television series The Resident. His newest book is The Price We Pay, What Broke American Health Care and How to Fix It. Dr. Marty McCary, thanks so much for joining us. Great to be with you, Jeff. It's great to have you here. How important is it to understand how we got to the health care system that we have today? Because it didn't just spring full-blown. I mean, we got here step by step over a long period of time. You know, if, Jeff, we can create health care literacy, I believe we can fix this system. It's just a matter of understanding how it works. I mean, look at the movie The Big Short. That movie created mass literacy around the banking industry by simply explaining it using relatable stories so anybody could understand it. That's what I try to do with this book in healthcare. You know, the politicians talk about different ways to finance our broken healthcare system. We need to talk about not just how to finance it, but we have to talk about how to fix it. And the story that nobody's talking about that we have to talk about are middlemen, pricing failures, and inappropriate care. And good stuff is happening in all those areas right now. Talk about the pricing failures and how we got to some of the problems that we see today. Well, I couldn't agree with your example more. I mean, look, if airlines did not get show you prices on travel websites, right? If you went to tra- Travelocity and Kayak and th- there were no prices and instead airlines said, we have to bill you after the flight because we can't give you a price there would be gouging all over the place, right? That would be an incompetent marketplace. That would be a place where people would get taken advantage of. And, and a lot of people would get rich on the airline corporate level by price gouging after the fact. That's exactly the problem we have right now. Now, it, it's one of the problems, but w- the price to deliver a baby in New York City today ranges from $4,000 to $70,000. That's not the sticker price. That's what insurance companies will pay out. And so what we need is a healthy marketplace. We're seeing new um, stuff like mdsave.com is a website that's an online platform where people can go and literally shop for a procedure and make their own quality decisions. Um, We're seeing Surgery Center of Oklahoma now post prices. We're seeing St. Thomas Hospital in Nashville post prices. I mean, this is a revolution now that if we can get more people engaged, if we can get more people to ask for a price, if we can get more people to negotiate their bills using information like like the reference based price you can look up on fairhealth.org, uh, we will create a revolution and it's starting to take shape. Of course, that revolution is only for the people that can afford it, no matter what the pricing is. There's still a lot of people that are left out of that system. And that's the disheartening thing is that those people who are what we call self-pay are getting taken advantage of them, taken advantage of the most sometimes. I mean, look, it's a disgrace that these people are being overcharged and price gouged after they come to the hospital to see one of us physicians and then they go home and they have their financial life destroyed. That's a disgrace. When American hospitals were built, most of them were built by churches 
And they were built with a mission to take care of people at a time when they were sick and to serve their community. And right now we've lost some public accountability for community hospitals. Look, most hospitals are run by good people. I honestly believe that. Uh, But they're working in a bad system. And they've inherited this crazy game of inflating prices so they can offer secret discounts to different insurance companies and individuals. And right now, everyday Americans are getting hammered with these surprise bills and these out-of-network bills. Given that, do we need to pull the whole system up by its roots? Do we need to eliminate the, the whole system of private insurance that we see now? Well, look, it's extremely frustrating to see all these stakeholders get crazy rich, except for one, the patient. And so um, we already, we spend 48% of all federal spending on healthcare. I mean, it's crazy. Think about that. Next time you go to file your taxes, 48% of all federal spending goes to healthcare in all of its hidden forms. And so it's very tempting when you see all of these stakeholders getting rich and all the lobbying dollars and all the middlemen and all these um, people profiteering from taking advantage of people when they're sick and vulnerable, you want to say, hey, let's just, Clean, clean the slate. Let's get, you know, Medicare for all, for example, is an attractive idea. But here's the problem. And here's where I would say I applaud those who have the intent of, of the good intentions of the so-called Medicare for all scrap the system concept. We all want, you know, health care for as many people as possible. But the system is so inefficient. Medicare is already running on fumes that, um, the idea of throwing good money after bad into this broken system, um, it has, um, it's financially irresponsible. For example, if we spend 48% of all federal spending on healthcare, what are we proposing taking it up to 80%, 90%. And over time, countries that have these Medicare for all systems over time cannot resist the urge to tighten the belt on healthcare. And over 10 or 20 years, you're left with a massively underfunded and dilapidated system. In fact, our own Medicare program is underfunded with increasing co-pays, and it's running on fumes. I think we've got to cut the waste. That is the solution. We already spend enough money on health care to give every person in our borders gold-plated health care. What we need to do is cut the waste. It's estimated that 30 to 35 percent of all Healthcare spending goes to waste, and I think we can see a new revolution if we can do what travel sites did by creating uh, uh, marketplaces, not for every patient. Not every patient is going to use pricing information, but proxy shoppers do, employers do, health plans do, the uninsured do, the high-deductible patients, some of them will use pricing information. And even though when I go to the grocery store, Jeff, I don't look at prices, to be very honest with you, God's been good to me. But my mom does, and her and her friends, which may be 10% of all the shoppers in the grocery store, penny shop and compare. They price compare every lemon at one grocery store to the other. Her and her friends are proxy shoppers and keep prices in check for the rest of us. And that's what we are starting to see in healthcare. It's already happening. Is fee-for-service medicine really at the core of this issue? I think it's the big driver of inappropriate care, and it's a terrible system. Paying doctors, um, look, I I love being a doctor. I love being a surgeon. But it's crazy that we would have quotas for to do, say, 30 operations by the end of each month, like a car salesman might. I mean, the fee-for-service system is insane. It undercompensates the good people going into pediatrics and psychiatry and family medicine and specialties that require spending a lot of time with folks. And I think what you're seeing, you know, I always try to pair a problem with a solution in the book or, or, or an innovator that's disrupting a field. Primary care is totally broken in the United States. Who likes 10 minute appointments with their doctors? And, you know, you get thrown some antibiotics for a viral infection because the mom's demanding it. That system is completely broken. And these doctors now are saying, We're going to start a new set of clinics called relationship-based medicine. We get paid on a lump sum, often by Medicare or by an employer, so patients don't have to 
get involved with anything financially. And we will take time with patients. We will assign them a patient navigator to coordinate all their care. We will treat diabetes with cooking classes and manage back pain with ice and physical therapy instead of surgery and opioids. And they're addressing now one of the, the big public health problems of loneliness with creating communities. And they're taking care of the whole person. These clinics are popping up, Jeff, all over the country. There's hundreds of them. In the last several years, they are growing like wildfire. Anyone over 65 can switch over at no cost. They go by the name Landmark, Oak Street, Iora, Chen Med. And the, this is an incredible bright spot of doctors who have said, we're going to totally reject the fee-for-service system. We're going to end the billing throughput model, and we're going to start medicine the way it was meant to be practiced by spending time with people and, and, and coordinating their care. One of the other it's a real bright spot. One of the other frustrating things about all this is that there are also other models around the world that are working and working a heck of a lot better, even though some of them certainly have problems, working a lot better than the system that we have. Yeah, I mean, look, <clears throat> other countries do not have pharmacy benefit managers. I mean, this is a crazy middleman in healthcare that is a uniquely American, you know, industry that sort of shuffles drugs around and, and, you know, overcharges businesses for the drugs that their employees take. I mean, our whole system structurally needs to change. And regardless if the government does something or not, I'm very optimistic, Jeff, because the private sector right now are starting to get educated and make better decisions. And that is moving markets. That is cutting waste that is doing incredible things that was the privilege of writing this book the price we pay is to educate folks on the decisions they can make businesses individuals the websites the tools and and the cool new things happening i mean that example i gave you where it, the price to deliver a baby ranges say in boston it ranges from seven thousand to forty one thousand an employer there said i want my employees to go to the seven thousand dollar hospitals They've, they're good quality, but I don't want to tell them where they can and can't go. So he offered to pay for free diapers and wipes for a year if any of his employees went to the $7,000 hospitals. Guess what? They all went to the $7,000 hospitals. They all had a great experience, and he saved millions. That's the kind of uh, new innovation that is coming out of this revolution for honesty and pricing. Talk a little bit about how doctors are viewing this, this period that we're going through now, this system that's so broken, and to what extent is any of it dealt with in medical schools today? Well, nothing is of this is dealt with in medical school. Our medical education is a disgrace. We spend, you know, years teaching young kids how to memorize the periodic table and the Krebs cycle and the urea cycle. And we have computers now, Jeff. Why are we teaching them rote memorization and regurgitation of things that you can easily look up and would never need to know in, an, in a time of an emergency? And so we're spending all of this time on regurgitation of knowledge. The students I talk to, you can talk to them six days after they take an exam. They've already forgotten 90% of it. The idea is not to cram as much information in their brains as possible. The, the, the goal should be to teach them the vocabulary and the self-awareness and the communication skills and the humility to say, I don't know, or knowing when to call for help. Those are the skills of a great physician. Those are, those are the qualities of great clinical judgment. And we're seeing new curricula. I highlight in the book uh, Thomas Jefferson University that's now – completely revamped the curriculum, realizing we had it all wrong. And they're teaching kids self-awareness and communication skills and how to know your limits and humility. And what we're seeing is this revolution right now among doctors to push back on broken primary care, to push back on this broken regurgitation-based education system, and to push back on all this bureaucratic you know, paperwork and regulatory stuff that we have to do that doesn't let us take care of patients. You know, a lot of people have gotten rich in healthcare 
but doctors and nurses' salaries have been stagnant for 30 years. And the patients are, are you know, paying the price of this giant industry getting, um, making record profits this year. So doctors are, are at record high levels of burnout, and I think we're seeing a massive revolution start to cha- take shape. I've certainly seen it in our advocacy work around patients that get sued for unpaid bills and have their paycheck garnished. We share those stories with the doctors, and they're livid. They're outraged, and they're now talking to their hospitals and saying, hey, we need honesty with billing. The, these money games and the price gouging, is threatening the great public trust in the medical profession, and we doctors are sick of it. And so we're seeing a revolution now to change these um, practices. How much have media images around doctors and medicine and hospitals, how much has that shaped the current landscape? I think it's done good and bad. I think this idea that we're going to you know, watch on the evening news every night, that we're on the brink of the cure for cancer, I don't think that's helpful. I think we talk about things in a very narrow uh, um, domain. We don't talk about um, we don't talk about learning from individual patients. You know, we had one patient that had a brain cancer uh, that's basically incurable, but he's alive at like 20 years later. We can learn from that individual. We can learn what does he eat, what did he do. It turns out he had a bad infection of his uh, brain tumor area after the tumor was removed. Maybe that did something. Maybe that bacteria sparked the immune system to fight the cancer. We can learn from individuals. We can learn from Eastern medicine. We can learn from patients. We can learn from observations. We can learn from clinical wisdom of doctors. We don't have to have a big randomized control trial to answer every question in medicine, we can learn from patients. And so I think you're seeing, you know, I personally was involved in in the TV show, The Resident. It was based on the first book I wrote because I wanted to create a different genre to say, hey, it's not just about the drama of, of taking care of patients. There's a drama to the business of medicine. And so I wanted to tell people, hey, this is what we deal with on the back end as doctors, and it's not always pretty. To what extent has has this broken system impacted patient care? In other words, when doctors are dealing with patients today, how much is the reality of the system, the cost, all of this part of and and entering into the doctor-patient relationship, in your view? Oh, I think I think we're, it's what we're seeing is an ex- a direct consequence of our broken system. I mean, patients are falling through the cracks left and right, and they're then they're hit with these massive bills. I mean, it's a disgrace. And so this movement now to say restore medicine to its mission, if that's what we can call it, is assigning people care coordinators and patient navigators. Uh, but patients are paying a heavy price for our broken healthcare system. Just look at the problem of inappropriate medical care. We created the opioid epidemic, okay? That was a mistake. It was a huge mistake. It was, there were a lot of hands involved. It's not just one group that we can blame. It's not just the manufacturers or just the salespeople or just the FDA or just doctors. We all had a hand in it. I feel terrible about the number of opioids I prescribed for years as a surgeon. I gave too many. I gave patients opioids who should have never gotten opioids. I now realize that, you know, I had good intentions and bad information, but we need good data to spread quickly. We need doctors to get on board rapidly. There's an average 17 year lag time for scientific evidence to get broadly incorporated into practice. And what we need to do is uh, speed that along. And so I go through a lot of the examples where patients are are, uh, getting educated and doctors are disseminating findings more rapidly. For example, appendicitis does not need surgery 75% of the time. Do you think all the doctors overnight are now offering antibiotics as a treatment for non-ruptured appendicitis instead of surgery? No, it's, it's a slow conversion. It's going to take a long time to get surgeons on board. It's going to take patient education. And so um, people need to be aware. And why is that? Why should it take so long? Well, um, 
I've had doctors argue that, yes, it's too long, but it may not be that much longer than, say, real estate's getting on board with new practices or lawyers learning about new laws. And it, I don't know, Jeff. It perplexes me. It's one of the things I don't understand in this world is why we um, take so long to adopt best practices. I think if you look at our medical education system, it's so rigid. I think by the time we spit people out, they're burnt out or sometimes entitled. I think we don't have great ways of disseminating in information. I think the journals have been telling us unless there's a randomized controlled trial, it's nothing is true, and that's not the right message. Um, but I don't know. It, it does bother me. You know, if you, your kid has a cavity, for example, that can be effectively treated with silver diamine drops. It's like nail polish. It gets painted over the cavity, highly effective, not for everybody, but many cavities can be treated this way now. But do you think dentists are calling all the kids that are scheduled for a drilling and saying, hey, this new study just came out. Let's try the silver diamine fluoride. The only side effect is it can darken the tooth. And heck, the tooth is coming out anyway for a lot of kids. My cousin, my nephew had it done. It worked perfectly. I had to really push it. it. It's scientifically based. It's a tragedy to see all of the inappropriate care that goes on out there. It bothers the good doctors as it bothers patients alike. And I think one of the keys is to educate folks on the newest therapies. And that's uh, part of what I did in the book. If the system isn't going to solve these problems, if it's not going to solve them quickly, does public policy have to intervene in a way that, that forces some of these solutions? Well, I've talked a lot with the government, and, you know, it's, you, sometimes you just want the government to take control. But the reality is the government doesn't do a very good job when it tries to get involved in clinical affairs for doctors. So what I've told the government leaders is keep the, the unnecessary burdens and paperwork and regulatory requirements away. Let doctors practice and encourage doctors fund the right research so that we can start um, really promoting best practices. Do you know that Alzheimer's disease is most likely uh, caused in part by chronic bad sleep? Okay, if you have sleep apnea, if you have trouble sleeping, if you only sleep four hours a night, you're at very high risk for Alzheimer's, according to many sleep experts now in the United States, physicians. Now, the NIH is on this race to find a, a drug for Alzheimer's. Okay, we need to do that. But as we're watching Alzheimer's rates surge and on the rise, can we talk about studies that look at quality of sleep and sleep apnea and what we should be telling our patients when they come in to see us for our, our annual, the annual visit. Can we talk about food as medicine and how ulcerative colitis and Crohn's and inflammatory bowel disease are all modern diseases that are a function of our modern diet. And so there's a lot we can do to really promote best practices without the government making the recommendation themselves. But, of course, as you said before, how long it takes for all of this to get into the system to be accepted. I mean, may maybe it will take government action to speed up the process. That's what I've been telling them to do is, look, convene these doctors, give them what they need to promote these best practices, and don't just fund drugs and drug development. Let's fund implementation science and behavior change among doctors. You know, we got doctors in a national project to reduce their patterns of overuse by simply showing them where they stand uh, with data relative to their peers. One hospital I, I profile in, in Santa Monica, California, showed individual doctors their C-section rates for uncomplicated labor and deliveries. And guess what? The high outliers, seeing that they're above the rest of their peers, um, automatically auto-corrected. And so we can use data in a powerful way instead of what we do now, which is just kind of like label an entire organization as a high or low performer. You know, if an airline has a rude flight attendant, and I know this is a stretch, Jeff, but just, you know, bear with me and imagine <laughs> that's the case. Imagine there's a rude flight attendant and the airline says, hey, our airline is doing below the average on our performance. 
Is that flight attendant going to change their behavior? No. But if you, if that flight attendant is told, hey, you're in the outer two percentile of flight attendants within our company, our managers are going to re-review your data in six months. Is that going to be actionable? You better believe it. They're going to change and auto-correct overnight. So that's what we're using now in this. Uh, that model is what we're using in our Improving Wisely campaign. Is there reason to be optimistic about any of this stuff? I know you talk about a lot of disruptors, a lot of people that are, that are doing some of these things in, in the price we pay. But a lot of it is not happening fast enough, and a lot of it is not catching on. Is there reason to be optimistic? You know, some of the stuff in Elkhead today just makes you furious. But in doing this research, I left extremely optimistic. And it wasn't because we're on the brink of a new government policy. It was because young people and our medical students and our young nurses and the residents and young doctors are saying, hey, this system is totally broken and we're going to redesign it from scratch. You know, the millennials today, Jeff, have a sense of social justice as a generational value. And they also have very little tolerance for BS. And they're looking at this broken system and they're like, look, uh, this is completely broken. We're going to redesign it. And so we're seeing these new models of care and these new navigation tools and these new transparent marketplaces where people can shop and these new patient education uh, uh, methods and these new classes for people to come together and, uh, and address health issues and talk about food as medicine and talk about um, other ways that we can, you know, think about what we take in and prevent uh, illness by looking at the lifestyle causes. It's a really cool movement right now, and I, it left me very optimistic. Uh, and also employer-based health care left me optimistic. Looking at what employers are doing as they get more intolerant of our broken system, and they're working directly with docs now, and they're uh, creating great benefits for their employees they are moving markets. They are creating demand for real value and honest pricing. Um, and then on the billing side, you're seeing our young doctors are saying, look, no patient should ever have to come to a hospital and ask for a price. And we give them the runaround and then they get shaken down in collections after the fact or get sued in court to have their paycheck garnished. This is baloney. We're not standing for it. And they are getting hospitals to change their ways our restoringmedicine.org movement has already gotten hospitals in the United States to completely stop suing patients altogether and to change the way that they bill their patients. Billing quality is medical quality. And financial toxicity is a medical complication. So taking care of a person is taking care of the whole patient. Dr. Marty McCary, the book is The Price We Pay, What Broke American Healthcare and How to Fix It. Marty, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Great to be with you, Jeff. Thank you.